Hello and welcome to the Psych Summaries podcast. My name is Hannah and I will be having conversations with clinicians, academics and experts that have applications to the field of psychology and mental health. They have many years of experience, meaning they are trusted voices in niche subjects. But I invite you to consume the content with a critical perspective, since a one-size-fits-all approach rarely applies to mental health. I hope you learn something and enjoy listening. Today I am so excited to be talking to Professor Jay Shri Kolkarni, who is a world leading expert in women's mental health with a particular interest in hormones. She directs a research centre, has set up the first all female psychiatric ward in Australia, has won many prestigious awards for her research work and has pioneered the use of oestrogen as a new treatment in schizophrenia. She is truly phenomenal and we discuss a range of topics relating to women's mental health such as the impact of hormone fluctuations, sex and gender differences between men and women, the impact of trauma and much much more. So let's get going. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please could we start with an introduction to yourself and your work? Hello, everybody. My name is Professor Jayshree Kulkarni. I'm a consultant psychiatrist and clinical researcher. I am particularly involved in women's mental health and have been researching aspects of women's mental health for about the last 30 years. In particular, I've been very interested in the role of hormones and in particular the gonadal hormones like oestrogen, progesterone and testosterone. The impact of these hormones and the fluctuations in the levels of those hormones on the brain resulting in mental ill health conditions in women. That's where I started and I started in schizophrenia research, but I have actually expanded into a lot of different areas looking at specific things like perimenopausal depression or menopausal depression, looking at premenstrual depression, looking at depression and the pill and postnatal disorders. All those particular points are all related to hormones. But I've also got a very broad interest in women's mental health and looking at, say, the safety for women if they need to be admitted as inpatients on on an inpatient unit, looking at equity and equality for women as measures of social determinants of mental health and so on. So mental health, women's mental health is my bag. I guess the first place that I wanted to start was When I looked you up, the thing that came up was the term psychoneuroendocrine studies. (laughs) Would you be able to define that and how it relates to the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal? (laughs) I have heard all of these terms before on their own, but never in the same sentence. Yes, so it is almost the most significant tongue twister you could try and say. But so psychoneuroendocrinology, if you break it down, psych as in psychology, psychiatry, neuro, the brain, and endocrinology, the study of hormones. So it's really the study of hormones impacting on the brain to create psychological symptoms or psychiatric symptoms. So psychoneuroendocrinology. The hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, the HPG axis, this is the hypothalamus, which is the high center, it's a higher center in the brain, as in it has the control of a lot of hormones. And again, the control from the hypothalamus down to the pituitary gland, which is also in the brain, then down to the gonads, which in women are the ovaries. And they're deep in the pelvis. And so that's why it's called the HPG axis, because the different bits there produce hormones that then have feedback back up again. So the the hormone messages go down one way and go back up the other. And they're all under the control of the higher centres of the brain all things like, you know, what you're perceiving in your environment, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, your memories, all of that gets expressed as hormone messengers and can influence hormone messengers backwards and forwards. It just really reiterates the kind of mind-body connection, doesn't it? I know, you know, we are in the medical world, so rooted in Descartes, separation (laughs) of both, but now it's so clear that everything is interconnected so how 
in females, do hormones play a role in our mental health? Are they protective against the onset of mental illness, i.e. if everything is functioning properly? And then on the back of that, how easy is it for our hormones to become dysfunctional, i.e. in our environment? So it's, it's again, it's interesting that you bring up Descartes because Descartes is, you know, ancient, ancient now, but we've sort of clung to that, which is quite bizarre that we've thought that the mind is separate from the body. And in particular, when I first started working on the area of hormone influence on mental health, I was treated like a pariah, you know, like, what are you talking about? You know, those hormones, a girl's hormones, are always about reproduction. And yes, of course, estrogen, progesterone have major roles in ovulation and pregnancy and fertility and all of that. Yes, all about reproduction. But in the last 15 years, the neuroscience has really advanced. And what we understand is that there are receptors and neurochemical transmission systems throughout the various parts of the brain. In fact, it's very widespread for estrogen in particular. So there are lots and lots of receptors and networks that really rely on estrogen in the brain to actually keep the connections and the new growth of the white matter or the circuits in the brain, like the computer circuits, growing and being healthy. And I think this is something that really puts paid to that concept that, you know, hormones are all about reproduction and, and therefore, you know, kind of only involve aspects below the waist. Whereas what we're talking about is, is a very integrated system. And we can see that in mental health. You know, that, for example, something as obvious as menopause, which is a hormone process where women have decreasing levels of estrogen and the other hormones as they age it ends reproduction uh, menopause ends the reproduction that process but there are also significant anxiety depression and cognitive or memory changes that occur as a result of the changes of the levels of hormones like estrogen so to answer your question estrogen is particularly neuroprotective it is one of the foremost neurosteroids that has a protective role in that it helps to grow dendrites or the connections between circuits. It also helps to maintain uh, and keep the various circuitry you know, in, in tune, if you like, to help lay down memories, cognition, new learning, and so on. So it's very potent and, and is neuroprotective. Progesterone has a different effect. It is often seen as the anti-anxiety hormone. And again, over time, at different times of life, there are different levels of progesterone that also vary with whatever situation the, the person is in. So, for example, in pregnancy, you might have heard of the, the brown cow syndrome where pregnant women sometimes are very content and very placid and and their and anxiety levels just you know seem to really shrink and so people think this is a progesterone effect in the brain so in that way progesterone is good for anxiety but perhaps not as neuroprotective in all of the other ways of circuit building and so on that i talked about with estrogen testosterone is different again not so neuroprotective in in the same sorts of ways and i think i think we still have a lot more to learn about the roles apart from obviously the hypothalamic sex drives and so on that testosterone have a big role to play but some of the other roles that testosterone play in say visuospatial memory which is that memory and task of say remembering shapes and you know how to orientate yourself in Ha, parallel parking your car for example so you know there are different sorts of activities that these hormones have in the brain but nonetheless i think really really important that we have more understanding more study and then apply that in our clinical work so that the next time some some poor young woman comes in and says i just can't function once a month for about a week that we don't just dismiss this as well don't be ridiculous you know you, you're just putting it on you're making too much of something or no, it can't possibly have anything to do with, with your hormones because it does. And 
you know, my thought goes straight to the fact that so many young women and, you know, women across the lifespan control their hormone levels, i.e. let's think about the contraceptive pill. So if someone has been on that for years or if someone is going on that or, you know, alternatively, if someone, like you say, gets pregnant and then, you know, postpartum, How do all of these changes in our hormones impact us? Would our body naturally kind of bounce back when we've adjusted our hormone levels, whether by choice or not? Or is this something that we really need to kind of, you know, supplement or do something different in our lifestyle to support that and reduce stress, let's say? Okay, so there's several parts in, in the in the discussion here. And the questions that really a lot of people ask is, is it about the standard hormone levels or is what is it? What we've found is that over time, it appears to be that the fluctuations in the hormone levels are really the issue. So when I talk about the premenstrual depression, anxiety and other things, it's because there is a fluctuation pre-menstrually with a dip in the particularly in the in the brain estrogen and and therefore body estrogen as well as changes in the other hormones but it's the change that seems to be the problem young girls pre-reproductive age will run on clearly low levels of estrogen and progesterone and testosterone but they're steady they're steady state so you don't have a cycle And it's in the reproductive woman when the cycle is there that we see more of the dependent mood changes on fluctuations in the hormones. So when you take the other big hormone events, for example, the menopause, which is a big event, that is also marked by very big fluctuations in estrogen and progesterone and the other hormones that occur over a long period of time. But nonetheless, it's in the fluctuations that the mental health gets impacted. And pregnancy, of course, with a massive rise in these hormones, many women describe their mental health being better than best during the pregnancy. And then postnatally, there's a sudden drop. In fact, it happens really fast. You know, the baby is delivered and within 24, 48 hours, the whole hormone world in the brain is is very, very different. And for some women, there are all sorts of theories about, you know, switch mechanisms that don't happen and so on. But there is a shift in the mental state postnatally leading to postnatal depression. So when we look at the pill, for example, the pill has this interesting effect. I mean, obviously, it's contraceptive. But why it's how it's doing that is it's blocking some of the fluctuations particularly in the pituitary, it's blocking the luteinizing hormone or a surge of luteinizing hormone, which then causes ovulation. But it's also smoothing out the fluctuations because you're taking a certain dose of the pill. And yes, there are many different types of pills of different dosing and different types. But eventually the the pill has this capacity to stop the cycling happening. And so we actually use that in treating women who have significant premenstrual depression. It does actually help to kind of flatten out the curves rather than have the massive fluctuations. So again, going back to the concept that it's the fluctuation that's difficult for the mental state. So then you could ask me, well, how come some women are okay and then get depressed on the pill? And that's because of the types of the progesterone in particular in the pills. Estrogen tends to be the neuroprotective hormone like we talked about. So estrogen is good for the brain, bluntly, and progesterone is variable. So in different doses and different types of progesterone, some women are very vulnerable and can actually develop depression for the first time when they take a certain type of progesterone in the pill. So that's individual variation coming into it as well. So, the, you know, what we've got is we've got an interesting environment now where there are lots of different hormone strategies. You know, there's the pill as a contraceptive strategy, but also as a treatment strategy to help to smooth out fluctuations in those women where 
say, premenstrually, depression occurs because of the fluctuation. We also have hormone treatments in the menopause age group, which can also help to, again, alleviate a lot of the mental health symptoms by, again, flattening the massive fluctuations that occur in the menopausal woman's brain. So, you know, here we have a, a new era, um, have had for a little while, but a new era to think about these particular hormone strategies as very useful strategies and thereby also understand more about the fluctuations and the impacts naturally thereof. Do we know how common it is for people to need hormonal treatment or to be susceptible to this hormonal fluctuation? It's not really spoken about. I don't think if I went to a GP, I would be asked about my hormones or even, you know, explore that. So it it makes me wonder, is it not that common? I think it's very common, but I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, it's not talked about. So in, in, if we looked at different bits, so if we look at the menopause group, for example, there are studies, and I think the Harvard Mood Study is probably one of the most um, well-quoted studies, that in fact, that a study in fact showed there was a 16-fold increase in depression at, in middle-aged women. So, you know, that's a massive rise in depression in that age group. And, you know, you don't have to think too hard to, to understand, well, okay, sure, middle-aged women may well be facing career crises, relationship crises, difficulties bringing up adolescent children, you know, midlife change stress, that's certainly part of it. But above and beyond that is this massive menopausal change. So, yes, that particular study and many others, which don't go to the 16-fold, but certainly talk about four times as much depression. And in fact, all would agree that there is a significant increase in depression in middle-aged women. So that's telling us something very significant, that this is a really important finding. But so many women would not know to correlate their mental state changes with their menopause transition. That's a process. Several reasons for that. Menopause transition is about 10 years. It's not quick. And it starts in the brain well before the body. So for about three to four years, there can be depression, anxiety, panic, changes in memory, changes in capacity to multitask, you know, hold lots of different concepts in your mind, all those sorts of things, well before the hot flushes hit. And everyone can diagnose menopause when the hot flushes hit. But this is the issue. This has been going on beforehand. And many, many, many women and practitioners don't actually think about this in the 43 or 44-year-old woman. That's the age group we're talking about. So that's one issue. The other group, I think, who hide a lot of their concerns um, or are not encouraged to talk about it is the premenstrual group. You know, there's almost this thing that PMS, premenstrual stress or premenstrual syndrome, became the sort of discredited thing that it was an excuse for women to behave badly or to be sort of very cranky and unrealistically annoyed with things or have a few days of headaches and bloating. So that's the my, that that's still uh, you know very irritating for many women and debilitating but it's not as debilitating as PMDD which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. That's a major depression that occurs premenstrually and that affects in most of the studies that are done looking at it uh, incidence prevalence about 10 to 12 percent of the reproductive age group population of women so when you look at that worldwide that's a significant number of women and yet um you know, many, many times I've seen in my clinic the story of the woman who comes in saying, look, I've tried to tell this doctor, that doctor, the other one, that, you know, this happens to me and I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder or I've been diagnosed with some other mainstream psychiatric diagnosis. E even worse, I've been diagnosed with personality disorder. You know, so, again, a range of factors that prevent people from, prevent healthcare practitioners thinking about the role of hormones on mental health. And I think that's that silo mentality that we earlier discussed, that um, there's a sort of odd concept that these hormones are about reproduction and not mental health. 
So, uh, you know, there's many, many um, opportunities to intervene effectively with hormone strategies. The major rule being trying to prevent the fluctuations to, to have a steady state. So again, if you look at menopause depression, when the menopause pressure process transition process has settled completely, and it's almost like, you know, back to a, a low level of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, that in fact, the mental health stuff settles down as well. So again, because there's not the fluctuation. It really makes me think about adolescence as well, because I know that, you know, adolescence is probably one of the the biggest times of your life where you're more susceptible to the onset of mental illness I know that you know by 25 75 percent of mental illness has had its onset so it does make me wonder if this is intrinsically linked with the changes in hormones that we kind of experience in in terms of kind of going backwards a little bit to PMS, how common is that? Is everybody susceptible to that or is that just the unlucky ones? No, and PMS is, you know, most of the data that comes in and these are community-wide surveys and so on, suggests that about 70% of reproductive age women have something. Uh, and that's taking the broader spectrum of assessment of symptoms, and that includes even just a bit of sore breast or just feeling a little bit out of sorts right from there to the major PMDD, which is the full-on depression. So it's very, very common that women experience something. But we're, we're more concerned about the very severe end of the spectrum because that's a group that are being ignored and invalidated in their observations. Now, you could say, why does that happen? Yes, there is a vulnerability in some women for their incredible susceptibility to hormone fluctuations. You know, you have the other end of the spectrum where some women, for example, go through IVF treatments for infertility and that, that's massive hormone injections and so on, but with no particular mental ill health conditions other than, you know, anxiety about getting pregnant, whereas some women have the most dreadful depression even with small shifts in the, in the regular cyclical changes. That's another interesting question as to why that happens. What's the vulnerability there? And we do think that there is a connection. This is our research that we're doing at the moment. We think that there is some connection for some women, not all, of early life trauma. And the women who have experienced early life difficulties, and I use the word trauma in a very broad sense, so it's, it's emotional, physical or sexual trauma, abuse, in early life, any of those even with just poor attachment, uh, which is a sort of psychoanalytical concept, but poor attachment to the primary caregiver, those sorts of things can actually have biological ripples in the brain. And so you can set up changes in the brain hormones, particularly the cortisol stress hormone, which then talks to the HPG axis or the gonadal axis that we were just talking about. Uh, also with with effects on the different neurochemical pathways. So, you know, we're hypothesizing and working on strategies to look at this in terms of what why are some women more vulnerable? Of course, it doesn't hold true in, in every case. And again, that just is. Some women just are more sensitive to hormone fluctuations on a cyclical basis does tend to run in families. Interesting. We, we spend a little bit of time chatting to the woman's mother or the woman's sister, and it's very commonly that it's a, you know, perhaps a genetic um, interplay, but then, you know, genetics and epigenetics is, is now sort of such a common concept that, you know, we would not just say something is genetic. That doesn't really mean much. This brings me on more broadly to the question of the disparities between men and women in mental health generally. Obviously, there's so much to talk about here. There's diagnosis, there's treatment, there's research. Do you have, you know, a figure that can show us whether there is really inequality here? Do females suffer on average more than men? Um, yes, the data that comes out, I know the Australian data really well, but again, similarly replicated in the big databases across uh, the countries. But 
Unfortunately, women do experience twice as much depression life cycle data shows there's a two to one female to male ratio of depression. There's a four to one female to male ratio of anxiety disorders. And that includes all of the post-traumatic stress disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, phobias, general anxiety as well. The other statistic is the 12 to one female to male eating disorders. So again, that's very dominantly female. And if you look at the other way, substance use and alcohol use disorders are usually more seen in males, although I'm sad to say that in COVID, we've seen a rather sharp rise, particularly in alcohol use abuse in women. So, you know, it's uh, not a good place to try and get equality, but um, that is one of the issues that is happening. So, The other situation is why are women more prone to mental ill health conditions? And that, I think, has its answer, is a big answer in, you know, taking a broad framework look at biology plus psychology plus sociology, a biopsychosocial framework. So I've spoken a bit about the biological framework in terms of the gonadal hormones, but there is also a whole range of social determinants of mental health, and that includes such things as power dynamics. So if you're disempowered, if you're in some cultures, women are are constantly second-class citizens without an equality basis, that can also play havoc on mental health. Housing, jobs, financial, the burden of care of the young and care of the elderly, you know, all of these different gender, not biological sex, but gender roles can play a big role in the social determinants of mental health. And we must not forget violence against women. This is a big, big factor. I talked about early life trauma, but there's obviously subsequent life traumas, the domestic violence situation, which unfortunately is so prevalent in many, many countries around the world, is a big factor in mental ill health in women. Then we have the psychological factors. So again, over time, women have been taught or taught themselves or fallen into various psychological defence mechanisms. So to be self-deprecating, to blame things inwardly if things go wrong, to perhaps be more self-harming rather than outwardly expressing anger, all different sorts of styles that may have socio-cultural mediation in how one expresses various emotionalities can also then have an impact on the emergence of mental ill health. So when we practice in my clinic and and other parts, I think biopsychosocial is our catchphrase because there are factors in all of those domains that also work all together to then create the platform for the development of mental ill health but equally gives us the platform for the treatment of the conditions and perhaps the prevention of the conditions. I mean, you've you've answered perfectly the next question I was going to ask you about, you know, the difference between biology and environment and other factors like that. But what I'm sensing is that the role that trauma plays, you know, as you say, talking about it broadly, is huge in how our hormones are impacted absolutely trauma i think we we don't really understand as much as we should or could about the biological impact of trauma we're getting better at understanding the psychological impact of obvious trauma and we're just starting to grapple with the psychological impacts of perhaps the less obvious traumas. Bullying would be an example of that. You know, in my era, it was, oh, that sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. Well, that's complete rubbish. You know, there's such an emotional trauma attached to the name calling and the various forms of emotional bullying that we see expressed in mental ill health conditions. So we are better at understanding psychological aspects of trauma The physical aspects of trauma and the sexual abuse traumas, many countries are now legislating against this and and trying to improve the social milieu. But what we haven't really got to grips with is the biological impact of trauma. And so it's really quite saddening when the field sort of splits into 
people who say, well, let's just, you know, go with the social determinants of, of mental health and try and sort out the judiciary, the police laws, the interventions for the abused wife or the abused woman. But then we don't want to use medications. We don't want to look at the biology or, or try and understand that because we really need for all of this to be working together to provide the best possible outcomes for somebody who's who's experienced trauma. And I think also, though, this uh, social determinants focus is a critical one. It's an important one because in the past, psychiatry did not consider trauma particularly well, I don't think. You know, it was it was sort of get diagnoses of particular disorders and, and on you go. So, again, you know, we, we need to have a fresh look and I think have an integrated look and bring in all the different fields and expertise in all the fields, but to work together. This is why the work that you're doing is so impressive, because as you say, traditionally, psychiatrists do just look at diagnoses and the biology. But as we know, life happens and there's so much more to mental illness than just you know the genes or the DNA that we are born with and you know the environment plays such a strong factor and leads me on to ask you have we seen any changes good or bad that has resulted from the pandemic do we have any data yet on whether these stats about you know prevalence of mental health or mental ill health shall I say has gotten worse Unfortunately, I haven't got anything good from the pandemic yet, but the really awful statistics, we did a survey here in Victoria and then there's also been an Australia-wide survey looking at the mental health of people broadly in the pandemic and women came out really suffering. Again, the mental health issues for women escalated during the lockdown periods, but that's also conflated by the increase in domestic violence. Dreadful stories of when women were locked in with a domestically abusive partner and so on and so on. Worldwide also, I've seen figures that replicate what's happened here. And certainly in your country, the increased rates of anxiety and depression follow the trends that we're seeing worldwide. So Really, it's been terrible mental health-wise, and I suspect that we haven't hit the worst yet because it's almost as if people are in any any situation, particularly a health situation, the first tranche of issues are usually about the physical health issues, and it's almost in the aftermath that you then start to see the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder, the mental health debacle then starts. So interestingly, as expected, the suicide rates improved during the actual lockdowns and so on because that's almost as if people garner all their resources to get through the acute crises. But we worry about what's going to happen, you know, a year from now, two years from now. And, of course, you have the other factors that impact on mental health like loss of job, loss of earnings, loss of socialisation loss of school education, disruption there, loss of potential for some of the various educational trajectories and, and of course, loss of relationships under stress. So, you know, there's a range of these sorts of issues that we're still, I think we're going to be waiting, you know, five years, even once the pandemic is declared over, and we can't wait for that. But, you know, once we declare that over, I think there will be a washout effect or wash up effect of a lot of mental ill health conditions then appearing. And unfortunately, women are bearing the brunt of a lot of this. It makes you not want to talk about it, but it's so important to talk about it and to kind of understand it. And it just fills my stomach with a big knot. It's horrible. Going back to the hormones, let's say PMS, PMDD, do we treat that hormonal imbalance with hormones or are we treating that with SSRIs or alternatives? So the current status quo is to treat PMDD with antidepressants. And again, I think this is unfortunate because often in that in that sort of trigger response you know the woman says she's depressed he's the antidepressant it's almost become a little bit too knee jerk and unfortunately 
Many health practitioners are not aware of the concept of PMDD. Many women are not aware of the concept of PMDD. And many women make the mistake of almost saying things like, well, I'm pretty bad, I'm, you know, depressed, can't get out of bed, and the symptoms of brain fog, I can't think. I just suddenly, you know, it's like I've got this total concrete in my head. I can't get out of bed. I've got no energy. I, I'm tired. I'm crying about nothing. All of these symptoms. And then she'll say, and it suddenly lifts. And, you know, you get that clicking of the fingers and immediate response. And that can get interpreted several ways that are wrong. It can get misinterpreted as she's putting it on, so she's making it all up, or she has a rapid cycling bipolar disorder. And in both of those circumstances, she will often not receive the attention around thinking about the hormonal aspects, and she herself has not thought about the hormonal aspects. So therefore, the response is to use an antidepressant, which is partially effective because SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, do in fact have impact on estrogen. But it's kind of like, you know, if you want to get from point A to point B, you can go via all the tiny little back roads and eventually get there. Or you could just take the main freeway and get there rather quickly and, and comfortably. So, you know, they're, they're not wrong to use an antidepressant, but it's not exactly the most direct way. And the other difficulty is a lot of antidepressants have a lot of side effects. The primary thing being it's very hard to stop taking an antidepressant, an SSRI or an SNRI, because they have a lot of withdrawal symptoms. So a number of women, if they're being treated with it, will find it extraordinarily difficult to then stop and then have to cope with all the side effects, including weight gain, including loss of libido and all sorts of other sexual difficulties, and then sort of only have a partial response. So as one of my patients said, isn't that bleeding obvious? If it's a hormonal problem, then treat it with a hormone. And I've got to agree. Yeah, I totally agree. I think this is something that's becoming more and more prevalent in the literature where, you know, researchers are thinking, well, if this is the root cause, if this is the pathway that has led to the onset, i.e. inflammation, or in this case, hormonal imbalance, then we need to be changing our treatments to suit that problem. If we know that that's the root, then we can treat that. You know, obviously, it's more difficult if we don't know. And of course, there are lots of different factors that do lead to the onset of mental illness, but it would surely, like you say, make sense to at least start there. And this does lead me perfectly on to my last question, which was firstly to say congratulations, because I, I read that you are kind of one of the leading experts that have you know, used oestrogen in the treatment of schizophrenia. And I just wanted to, you know, explore that a little bit more, whether that's just in the treatment of women or whether that's, you know, for men too. And what that's actually doing, is it is it making symptoms better? Is it, you know, alleviating them? Is it making them cease completely? I thought that was mind blowing. I had not heard that that was being used in the treatment of schizophrenia until I came across your work. So I've been working on using oestrogen treatments for schizophrenia uh, for a long time now. That's where I actually started my, my career in working in schizophrenia and women with schizophrenia first. And that was obviously easier to manipulate the oestrogen type and to use the dosing and so on. But what we found was, and we've published the studies to show that, in fact, there were quite dramatic changes in the very acute psychology symptoms of hearing voices and delusional beliefs as well. Not in everyone, but in a significant proportion of the women who we involved in our clinical trials. That led us then to think that, okay, what is happening here in terms of where is this working? And what we think is going on is that, in fact, estradiol, which is the purest form of estrogen, is actually a potent antipsychotic and working through the same neuroreceptor systems or the neurotransmitter systems, dopamine, serotonin, that are disordered in the person who is psychotic. So 
obviously, if you look at it from that perspective, and men have estrogen in the brain as well, estrogen should work in men. So we started to work with men with estrogen, but being very careful to only use low dose and use very short term because there is a feminization aspect with using estrogen in men. So we also found that in the men who did have higher, higher levels of estradiol in their, in their blood once we used the treatment, they also improved in the psychotic symptoms. So it does work for men, but you've got the feminization problem. What's been really exciting in the field and what we're working with now is a group of hormones called the Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulators, S-E-R-M. S, SERMs. The SERMs are, as they say, selective estrogen. So they work on the particular estrogen receptors that are in the brain and in the bone, but not in breast tissue, uterus or ovaries. This means that they don't feminize and they don't affect the reproductive tissues, which is really important because, of course, there was the Women's Health Initiative study that everyone freaked out about in 2000, 2001, about HRT being really bad. And, and we do have to worry about long-term use of estrogen because it can create breast cancers and so on, is the concept. I mean, we don't actually have all the data on that. But um, SERMs, Selective Estrogen Receptor Modulators, allows us to then get past that issue because it's not actually working affecting the breast tissue or the uterus or the ovaries. And it's actually working beautifully in the brain, in the bits, the receptors that we want it to work in. And it's also helpful in males because you're not then going to feminize the, the, the male patient. So these are several trials that are ongoing. We've published the early SERM studies, which was with raloxifen, which was the first SERM that was used. It was produced to help women with osteoporosis, menopausal women with osteoporosis, and we adapted it to work for this condition. So we're really thrilled and excited that there are developments coming on that I think will be very useful, not just in schizophrenia, but at the moment we're looking at SERMs in depression in menopausal women. And we're also excited by what's going on in the progesterone field, that there are new progesterones that are coming out that are being actually, we're trialling at the moment, looking at them for specific treatment of premenstrual depression and postnatal depression. And we think that probably in the next five years, there'll be several more of the hormone products available so that it's going to be important to educate the broader community, you know, women in particular, and healthcare practitioners to understand that hormones really do have an impact on mental health. And here's a whole vast array of other new hormones that might be better for the woman who has depression premenstrually, postnatally, perimenopausally, and in other circumstances too. It's honestly so fascinating. I am so impressed that you guys have done this work. I didn't even know it was it was being done. So it really does make me excited. I know so many people that complain of PMS or PMDD. And I guess the last thing I just wanted to run past you was the concept of taking too much estrogen and or other hormones. So obviously, we talked about the fact that the fluctuation of hormones was what may be causing mental ill health. And I heard you say that you have used the pill to support people actually balance that out. But then also on the other end of it, there's the idea that you can, if you take that for too long, cause health problems long term. So should we be scared of supplementing or taking these pills long term that do protect us in the moment by balancing us out? Because obviously GPs do hand out hormonal pills quite quickly and easily. But is this something we need to be thinking about? So I am always an advocate for if somebody is struggling with symptoms that are affecting her life, her quality of life, then we need to help her. I don't particularly think we go into using 
hormone strategies as a preventative necessarily. And that was the problem with the Women's Health Initiative study, that there was this concept that somehow uh, using HRT, hormone replacement therapy, was going to prevent cardiovascular disease or strokes and so on. And that was that was totally refuted. So similarly, I'm not an advocate of, you know, um, doing something for some nebulous reason. But I'm very clear that, you know, I see too many young women whose lives are really wrecked by PMDD, for example. And certainly the young mother with postnatal depression is in dire straits if we can't fix that for her in terms of the bonding and all sorts of things. And the menopausal woman, you know, who's a high-flying executive with adolescent children and, and suddenly her life just goes completely down the tube. These are obvious cases where we've got to intervene with her collaboration. That's one point. The second point is always, 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 it's body and mind, mind and body. So we can't be doing something that might help one and, and disturb the other. So always when we're looking at a hormone potential treatment, we take a very careful story about the whole issue of is there breast cancer in this person's family? Is it very pronounced in this person's family? Is there a story of deep vein thrombosis or other blood clotting disorders? You know, so we have to always be scanning and screening for physical health conditions. And that's the same, you know, in the in the young woman taking the pill as well, because we recognize that this is synthetic external hormone products. So always we do the full screening and I would add, I would advocate for everybody to make sure that they have good health screening and then have regular tests. So, you know, we're, we're very big on if she's young, have breast ultrasound, which does not include radiation. But the minute she hits 50, then she should be having mammograms on a regular basis, regular cerv cervical screening with pap smears and so on, regular blood pressure checks, these things are good health practices. And of course, there's the healthy lifestyle advice. So women who are gaining a lot of weight, that's going to be counterproductive for her health and also her mental health. So I think we've got to look at body and mind and make sure that we also include all of the other potential and very useful modalities for well-being, which include such things as healthy eating, healthy exercise, mindfulness, meditation. If you're an artist, you know, please don't stifle that creativity. Similarly with writing, music, sports, all of these things are, have an effect on the brain that are positive. And it's about the holistic approach. But in all of this, yes, very important to keep monitoring physical health because these are synthetic medications and every medication can have its problem. But on the other hand, it could be the difference between a dreadful quality of life and actually being able to do what you want to do with your life. Yeah, ultimately, it always comes back to the individual and the unique factors and hopefully it's the kind of doctor or GP that's working with the individual that does these screenings but it's really good to be aware of the fact that you can also kind of ask that they double check these things and or also you know tell them about what you know about your family history so thank you so much for answering that and just generally thank you so much for your time today I am so grateful I have been hanging on your every word you are a fountain of knowledge and I'm so grateful that you took the time to speak to us I think so many people are going to find this fascinating and super helpful so yeah I'm just super grateful but thank you so much Hannah because you see really we can publish in learned journals we can do the clinical research and do it by all the strict means and we need to but we've got to get the word out there to every woman because otherwise what we put into the journals can be just sort of disappearing and, and not really then have an impact. So thank you very much for all the hard work that you do in, in getting the word out there. Thank you. As you say, it's important because people don't know how to depict research and they also aren't understanding what's going on because the media often misrepresent the findings. So yeah, it's about yes. working together for sure. But yeah, thank you so much. No worries. Thanks again, Hannah. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode with Jay Shree Kolkani. I was so honoured that she gave up her time to chat to us and I will leave links to her work if you'd like to take a further look. 
I hope you learned something and enjoyed listening. And if you do enjoy these podcasts, please do consider donating to my Patreon page in the bio on my Instagram at Psych Summaries. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next time.